Hi everyone, my name is Abdallah and I'm a tenure track researcher at CWI in Amsterdam. Today I'm going to present our CHI 2020 work titled Thermalware, exploring wearable on chest thermal displays to augment voice messages with AFEC. This is a joint collaboration with my co-authors at TU Delft and the University of Oldenburg. Okay, so first, why study voice prosody? Well, first of all, uh, voice can be ambiguous in terms of situational impairments such as ironic speech. But also, in remote settings, if gestures are not visible always, then this could also leave room for misinterpretation. With respect to medical conditions such as autism spectrum disorder, uh, emotional prosody processing could also be impaired. Furthermore, for vo intelligent voice assistants such as Alexa, you can also have um, missing emotional prosody from those devices. So there's been quite some work investigating the relationship between emotions, media, and temperature. In 2017, for example, Tuval et al. looked at Facebook posts and whether thermal stimulation can influence the valence and arousal of Facebook posts. But also, for example, uh, whether we look at images and whether we interpret images in a warmer manner or not. So the common denominator across this body of work is that warm temperatures are generally associated with being pleasant, comfortable, and increasing social proximity while cold temperatures are generally perceived to be uncomfortable and to be distant. So why do we focus on the upper chest? So according to the bodily map of emotion from Newman, Mayat, Al in 2014, they ran five experiments with around 700 participants where they were shown two silhouettes of bodies alongside emotional words, stories, movies, or facial expressions. And here they were asked to color the bodily, the bodily region whose activity they felt was increasing or decreasing while viewing the stimulus. And what you can see from here is that the upper chest area seems to be common across many of the emotions. We furthermore used Ziegler's wearability guidelines. Ziegler had originally provided 13 wearability body maps, and here we use three, motion impedance, garment manufacturing, and social acceptability. And if we overlay all of these, we find that also the upper chest area seems to be a suitable location to be testing thermal simulation. So for this work, we asked, is it feasible to design a wearable upper chest thermal display for augmenting brief voice messages? And how do such thermal simulation affect emotional perception from neutrally spoken voice messages? And here, it's important to focus on ensuring accurate temperature perception, thermal comfort, and fast thermal stimuli detection times. We contribute two things. First of all, thermal wear, which is a wearable on chest thermal display, and second, empirical findings that show that neutral voice messages can be augmented with affect through thermal stimulation. We made all our source code available, so please take a look at the GitHub page. So with respect to designing thermal wear, we can look at fabric as a contact medium, where we would have an outer fabric layer, an actuator, so in this case a Peltier element, and an inner fabric layer to, to test whether it's comfortable or not. So here we looked at and ran early tests on material choice between silk, polyester, wool, and cotton. And for these early pilot tests, we applied four balls across fabrics, providing either warm or cold simulation. And based on this feedback, we found that silk provides the least irritation, is less sensationally stimulating than polyester, and allows heat to spread evenly in contrast with cotton. Moreover, research has shown that knitted fabrics have lower values of thermal conductivity with woven fabrics because they're generally thicker. Therefore, considering the thermal conductivity, woven fabrics were the better choice for us to use. So this is what the vest looks like from the inner area to the outer area. And what's important to note here is that for the outer vest area, we had to include a heat sink to, so we can dissipate the heat so as not to provide too much discomfort for users. And this is how our prototype looks like. It's perhaps a bit clunky, but it works. So we had Peltier elements, Tech one thermoelectric modules here as thermal stimulators. And it consists of a custom ESP8266 microcontroller, which we designed, a 3.3 volt regulator, a thermal couple to digital converter, a K-type thermal couple, a DC motor driver, and a Peltier element attached to the heatsink, which connects to a laptop through a serial to USB cable. And with this prototype, we move to experiment one, where we look at on chest thermal perception and comfort. So this is what our setup looks like. We had a laptop, the actual thermal wear vest, microcontroller, the vouchers, which we gave to participants for participating, 
thermometer, and all interaction happened through a smartphone. We had an Empatica E4 wristband just to measure the baseline skin temperature, which sits around 32 degrees. Our aim in the first experiment was to explore thermal perception across contact medium, so fabric versus no fabric, thermal intensity, low versus high, and direction of change, cool versus warm. We tested 12 participants where participants entered their ratings on an Android application. And here we measured a seven point temperature ratings and seven point comfort ratings, as well as detection times where participants had to press a feel it button when they felt the thermal stimulation. So we ran Friedman rank sum tests for, to look at main effects and post hoc man Whitney tests with one Froni correction to assess pairwise differences um, between conditions. And two observations can be made here. First of all, a sanity check that warm temperatures are perceived to be warm and cool temperatures are perceived to be cool. So our prototype works. And as in prior work, for example, Paris et al. 2019, our results also supported generally consistent finding that perception of cold thermal stimuli, whether it relates to participant sensitivity or detection times, is generally greater than warmer stimuli. With respect to comfort ratings, we found no significant effects. So whether it was low intensities or high intensities, with fabric or without fabric, it was generally perceived to be neutral. And for, detec for detection times, without fabric, intuitively makes sense that it was faster, but also for higher intensities. And so here, for warmer stimuli, the average detection times without fabric went from 8 seconds, low intensity, to 4.7 seconds for high intensity. And for cooler stimuli, the average detection times range from 5.5 seconds for lower intensity to 5 seconds for higher intensity. So needless to say, we chose to test without fabric, given that our comfort ratings showed no significant results. So if we look at example trials of cooling and warming onset and durations across intensities for real-time temperatures, here we can see that in general, fabric has a dulling effect on thermal perception and that silk prolongs detection times without significantly increasing comfort. So therefore, we chose to test thermal stimuli directly on the skin for experiment two. And this is important as well because voice messages are on average two seconds in duration. So this may create a mismatch in presentation time and thus requires a higher rate of change. So with respect to experiment two, we look at specifically the effects of on-chest thermal stimuli on the affect of voice messages. And it's important to note here that we look at continuous models of emotion. So we look at valence and arousal on a continuous scale rather than discrete emotion categories. Here we draw the EU Emotion Voice Database. And this is a voice database containing a total of around 2,200 validated emotional voice stimuli. These stimuli consist of audio recordings across 54 actors, each uttering sentences with an intention of conveying 20 different emotional states. In order for us to generate the neutral voice stimuli, we selected eight messages four positive, four negative, and we used WaveNet to generate our neutral voice messages. So we kept the parameters as constant as possible, for example, pitch, speed, and which WaveNet code in accordance to the gender of the original voice message. To ensure that those messages were indeed neutral, we ran an annotation study with seven participants where we achieved reasonable interclass correlations. So now I'll give you some examples of what these messages sound like. So first I'll play the EU Emotion Voice version and then followed by the version that we generated. Mmm, I love chocolate. And now the neutral version. Hmm, I love chocolate. And for our negative valence message. Ugh, cover your mouth when you sneeze. Cover your mouth when you sneeze. There's a lot more details in the paper, which aids in reproducing our work. So please take a look if you're interested. So for this experiment, we had a two positive versus negative message valence by three warm versus cool versus no stimulation design. And since we test eight voice messages, each session consisted of 24 trials. Now, given our hardware setup, we provide a two minute break after eight trials, resulting in two breaks per session. And after experiencing the stimuli and the voice messages simultaneously, Participants had to enter their valence and their arousal ratings through an Android application where they had to fill in a nine-point self-assessment mannequin scale. And we also collected uh, subjective feedback through some structured interviews at the end of the session. So here we again applied a Friedman rank sum test since our data was not normally distributed. And we ran post hoc man with tests with Monfroni correction where applicable for pairwise comparisons. 
I'll break these figures down in the next slide. So here, thermal simulation influences valence of a neutrally spoken voice message, which addresses our second resource question. This, however, varies across cool and warm stimuli. So first, while the warm stimuli increase the valence of positive messages, this is not so for negative ones. Cool stimuli, on the other hand, lower the valence of both positive and negative messages. Furthermore, we show that thermal stimulation generally increases arousal, though not uniformly across warm and cool stimuli either. For negative messages, both warm and cool stimuli increase arousal, and this is in line with earlier findings by Salmin and Natal in 2011, who showed that warm and cool stimuli can increase arousal over neutral, but that warm stimuli are more arousing than cooler stimuli. It's worth noting here that in their original paper, they looked at thermal stimuli by themselves without any coupling to medium. Our findings, however, differ from Tyrell et al.'s work on thermally stimulating Facebook posts, where they don't find an effect of thermal stimulation on valence ratings, only for arousal. So why might this be the case? So within their work, they didn't really control for context, and participants may have found the task ambiguous when they looked at individual Facebook posts. By contrast, our voice messages could be largely seen as standalone units of conversation, and it steers participants to rate the valence of the spoken message but the arousal of the speaker in the way they're actually speaking the message. So this attribution of intention could have played a part and likely made our experimental setup less ambiguous, which may explain why we saw effects on valence and they didn't. So finally, based on our semi-structured interviews, we find further confirmation with regarding warm and coolness. So for warm stimuli, most participants stated that the positive messages became more positive. So for example, P3 said, if it's warm, I can sense a positive emotion sincere. And for cooler stimuli, most participants stated that the cooler stimuli lowered the valence of the positive messages. So in a way, it makes it more distant or colder. So example, P1 says, I feel it's not that positive anymore. P8 says, he is not speaking sincerely, which is interesting to see. So finally, we have a number of considerations resulting from this work. So with regard to the upper chest, it appears that warm and cool stimuli are comfortably tolerable, easily perceived, and quickly detected. And if we're going to add fabric, we need to consider the trade-off between the comfort that it provides and the detection times that it lowers. And as we saw, context matters. So while thermal stimuli influences both valence and arousal, it could also influence only arousal depending on how much of context we actually know. And while we discuss this in the paper, trying to recreate paucity using thermal stimulation alone is a bit tricky, and perhaps it cannot be done. So in our case, there was no consistent means of us re reproducing paucity. And finally, I want to end with three items that these are key factors we had to really face here, which were um, which fabric and wearability comfort are we aiming for when we're designing such a prototype? and what's a good temperature perception and comfort, and what's a suitable detection time for our, for our case. And regarding thermally stimulating valence and arousal, in, on which body location are we interested in providing this? And these help design wearables for thermally stimulating different aspects uh, of our interactions, such as voice. And so if we go towards wearable thermal voice augmentation displays, it has a number of uses, one of which is emotional positive augmentation, for example, for people who have impairments, such as autism spectrum disorder, but also for voice assistance, either to help supplant emotional positivity where it's missing or to indicate things like urgency. And finally, thermal simulation as a wearable could also be used as a bodily emotional elicitation technique. So thank you very much, and if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or send me a message on Twitter. So thank you very much.